right. It's 4.31. Kick the meeting off and start with the roll call. Uh, Commissioner Josephson is not here with us today. Um, he had a conflict. She had a conflict. Uh, Commissioner Fribley. Here. Uh, Commissioner Helner said she'd be a little bit late. Commissioner Donovan. Here. Commissioner Wood. Here. Commissioner Swainson Harris. Here. Commissioner Howard. Present. And Commissioner Shannon uh, sent in notice. I, some of you may have seen that he's no longer going to be on the commission um, due to some conflicts with work. So I thanked him for his participation. And we do have an active search for more members, I think, currently as we speak. So I'll need to send a notification that we have two seats that we Okay. Yeah. And one of those will be my seat. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, uh, land acknowledgement. So I will take a moment here to acknowledge that the land we're on, that we now call Springfield, is located on the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. We acknowledge that the city of Springfield shares its history with the exclusion and erasure of many indigenous people, including Kalapuya and those who first inhabited land on which we are located. We also acknowledge that Kalapuya people are still stewards of this land and contribute to our history today. All right. So today we are going to, um, we've got a couple things. Um, we should have Shannon, our consultant, joining us here, hopefully. Um, I just sent her an email seconds ago um, reminding her. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully she's joining us. She said she was planning on it, um, but I asked her to join us today to give us an update on the ILS project that we helped fund um, for Willie Moline. I thought y'all might be interested in hearing what went into that and what some of her findings were for the gray, gray house that she studied, um, which is both city and um, late owned. And um, other than that, we're gonna run through whatever needs to be touched on on our work plan items. And we also have a kind of a longer list for next steps and updates relating to elections, chair nomination, um, planning for visioning for our next work plan, um, and then rescheduling our November, December meeting because of Thanksgiving, Christmas conflict we have every year. <laughs> so figuring that out. Um, and also um, potentially changing our meeting time. No request has come in for that. So we can talk about that at the end of the meeting. Is there anything else that commissioners would like to discuss today? All right. Great. Um, do we have any public comment or business from the audience? That you know? There was none on SOS. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Any land use applications? No current land use applications. Okay, so, and Shannon, are you on? I can't quite tell if we're seeing everybody. There's just four, okay. All right, so let's pause on that and um, hopefully she'll join us. Um, so we've got, uh, let's just jump into reviewing the work plan. Um, so on, we have completed the awards. Yes. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> For now. This was like a tighter process, I think, because, right? Because we did them um, within a year of each other almost. Is that right? Or no, it was about yeah. the same. It was a full year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it was. We talked about doing it sooner, but we didn't. Yeah. Um, do you want to give an update on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So did we meet? We haven't met. So we had the awards presented at council, but the handshake on the fifth. Um, and both recipients uh, were there. And I thought it was really nice. It was very brief, but it was really nice. Um, and then uh, we, three days later, four days later, three days later, at uh, Art Walk slash Block Party, um, we sort of set it up as the Heritage Award celebration. Um, it was on the Art Walk flyer as such. Um, we made a couple of posters that were in the foyer of the museum uh, and, you know, people could come in and 
as they came in during our walk, you know, see that. And um, we had arranged to have the recipients there. And we also at the last minute arranged to have a uh, news camera show up at a certain time. Um, and then it turned out that none of that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we, yeah. So we didn't, we got one of the recipients there only very reluctantly. The other recipient ended up having you know, back issues and didn't end up making it to the block party that night. And then the camera crew also uh, flaked out. So. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody was disappointed. Um, and uh, they said, oh, well, well, maybe we can follow up and do something. You know, I don't know if they're ever going to follow up, but whatever. We could still reach out to the Chronicle or something and see if they'll yeah. maybe do something to showcase the winners. So. Are they still up in the museum or do they just... The watch? posters are still... Uh, I don't actually remember now. I was just there. I don't remember if they turned and they're not on the same spot. Okay. No, I don't remember if they're actually there anymore. But we could hang them somewhere else, I guess. Too. Yeah. I wonder if we could put them in the window. Like in a window or something. Yeah. Yeah, for a yeah. while. Don't yeah. Yeah. If everyone cancels, no one cancels, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. I also got a picture, you probably did too, but of the two posters right at the entryway. Oh, cool. And so if we wanted to send that yeah. to each of the um, awardees and let them know that they were featured and thank you or whatever to close it out. Yeah, I'm not sure if I did get a good one. So yeah, maybe. Okay. Um, any other? So wrapping up on that. like Yeah, so we still need the, I don't know what it's going to actually happen. We need to have like a wrap up meeting about the jury process and the selection process and lessons learned and what we want to do for next year and categories and wordsmithings and all of that stuff while it's still kind of fresh. Mm -hmm. um, but I leave end of next week for two and a half weeks. So it's not going to happen before that. It's always not going to happen during that. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, November. <laughs> November. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then obviously we can start anytime planning for next year. Yeah. We'll take a little break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. All right. Um, we don't have anything on postcards. Was well, there any other comments about awards from anybody else? I know some of you made it out. No. Uh, <laughs> postcards. <laughs> um, I don't think we have anything that's concluded pretty much. Yeah, I, just, I still have brought them over here, but yeah. Um, walking tour guides. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this and get a little bit more sort of background and maybe conversation about what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So I have been on both of them. I made my husband come with me to get the perspective of somebody who's <laughs> less enthused about old buildings than I am. Um, we had a, a pretty good time. I actually think um, it's a, a pretty delightful way to, to spend an hour or two. Um, I think the big questions that sort of came up to me um, through the process, especially around um, not so much with the downtown one, but very much with the, the Washburn district one, I wanted to understand a little bit more about how we selected which properties to highlight. Um, one of the things that I, I found my, my husband kept asking me, because I was the person with the book, is we'd walk past a house that had a sign that mm -hmm. was, a, you know, a, a historic home, and it wasn't in the book, and he'd go, why isn't this one in it? Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to see if anybody had sort of insights on that, and then to talk about do we envision this as just kind of sprucing up the language and maybe finding some older versus newer pictures of the ones that are currently in the book? Or do we want to talk about maybe revisiting what we've chosen to put in the book um, as well? I don't, I don't even know when that was made. I mean, it was long before our times. So I feel like yeah. it could have been when they started the Washburn District. It could have been like it was like the late 80s or maybe the 90s. They did that. Anything at the yeah. <laughs> it says that the information is from the original survey yeah. okay. that they did. Um, the pictures seem to be pretty old just based on the size of the trees in the pictures versus the size of the trees now. Um, so it is entirely plausible to me that this is what they picked when they first created the historic district or shortly after. Um, I think the other piece I sort of wanted to raise is there's a lot of info in it about what's inside the houses. And I think we maybe don't want to uh, 
convey all of that information, um, it, it sort of creates a situation, I think, that encourages people to try to peer into people's windows <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, or tell them about something they're not able to see. And I think it might be good for us to, to think about that. And if we're going to include that, maybe at least think about talking to the people who have those homes to find out if they're comfortable having a public document that says how many bedrooms they have and <laughs> where the kitchen is located. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the bedrooms thing is public. I mean, it's yeah, I suppose, that's really easy. I suppose that's yeah. true, but it's but still like, kind of an odd, yeah. you know, yeah. I think there's a bit of a different dynamic when it's a publicly accessible record versus a document that we are publishing and distributing. I yeah. think that maybe creates sort of an awkward dynamic that I at least want to give people a heads up about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I was the person, you know, doing this today, I don't know if that conversation happened 20 years ago right um so yeah I kind of wanted to just see what folks uh, reactions were or what folks um thought about uh, how much we want to modernize this mm -hmm. so my recollection is that the house is in the book and then the map are not well coordinated like you can't, they're like the number, like if you were to try to like, there's something funny about cross-referencing. Yes. Like the, yeah. So the map is just in the middle of the book. Right. But don't, it has little numbers, right? And, yeah. But and, they don't necessarily correspond to the order of the houses in the book or something like that, or there's no way to look back and forth. They largely do, except yeah. there are two optional detours gotcha. that are just at the back of the book. One of the optional detours is at the start of the tour. One of the optional detours is at the end of the tour. Yeah. Uh, those ones are labeled with letters. The other ones are labeled with numbers. I think there's maybe an option to maybe just have one walking route. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or is it like maybe, maybe I'm thinking of the downtown one too, but the, on the map they're numbered, but when you flip to the actual page of the house, it doesn't have a number or anything. Like I'm constantly looking at the map and I'm like, okay, which one is that? And then I'm like trying to just flip through the book to figure out you're just walking through. It has a number at the bottom. All right. Uh, at the bottom. At, at least in the printing I was looking at, yeah, it yeah. did. But it is a sort of odd. I mean, the map is just in the center of the book. Yeah. Um. So you're flipping to one side of it, and then you're flipping to the other side of it, and it is just there, one through twenty-two, and then A through. I want to say C. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that's definitely like just cleaning up the route mm -hmm. and the um numbering, making it a little bit easier to understand could be good. Um, the selections, I have no idea. I mean, yeah, I don't know how they decided. What I'm to guessing their primary contributing yeah. houses. Some and of them. maybe it's yeah. the ones of people who responded it was okay to be included mm -hmm. in the tour would be one consideration. Or maybe they tried to like come up with a path and then pick a few yeah. specifically to make that path work out. Mm -hmm. And some of them are sort of um interesting unique things so there's like the the old firehouse and the old hospital mm -hmm. so stuff like that I think it's sort of clear why it's included but then you sort of get to this thing where it's like you have two very similar houses right next to each other and one of them is in the guide one of them is not <laughs> um yeah. and I just wasn't sure if that's something um we want to think about I also wasn't sure if we want to think about you know are there other parts of our history that aren't highlighted in the guide that we want to talk more about. Um, there's a, some very brief historical descriptions in both guides. There's not a lot of history. Um, it certainly focuses a little bit more on the architecture, So, I, which in some ways is um, I think maybe worded in a way that isn't particularly accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's maybe some options to look at that too. Um, so I think there is a piece where we might wanna talk about, you know, what what do we want to accomplish with this document? That's a pretty question. <laughs> Has the museum committee talked about this at all? I'm curious. Um, no, not really. I think, I mean, we're working on the historic atlas, which ultimately may provide some good, you know, content at least to help feed into whatever, you know, however what we want to re envision this. Um, sure. And we've certainly written some some words about the district and whatnot that could make a nice introduction. Um, but we haven't talked about as a committee yeah. revamping that kind of book. 
would it help to have because it seems like the museum's interested in this i would think um i'm mm -hmm. i mean again, the, certainly I by the committee Adam, if you have perspective on this yeah. too um but it does, I don't know, it seems like something they promote it for us. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. I mean, people stop by and grab the flyers all the time, right? That's like the only place to grab information about local history, right? Yeah. So if you're a nerd and you want a book about local history, <laughs> that's where you're going to go. Because Right. Right. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure we can rally the museum committee to participate. Yeah. Um, the, I think in my own mind, I keep envisioning that we make this a much more complicated project that <laughs> 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 involves, right you. involves like, <laughs> you know, medallions and QR codes and like, you know, all this other stuff. But this can just be very simple for now. Like, I don't think it, we have to go that route. Sure. But I was just in a, a Carmel or Monterey. I don't know. I have a picture on my phone. And they have these really cool medallions in the sidewalks up for like the historic tour like you'd walk along the sidewalks and you'd see another like, okay you go that way and then you go that way and that would be really cool and they had them that actually the medallions were in they alternated between being in english and spanish as well like the little things which i thought was really cool um and i can show those pictures but um so we could very much you know make this even more intense but it could just start with the book I think there could yeah. be a value to in figuring out, you know, what do we do as we work on modernizing the book mm -hmm. to make this something that we can add to, mm -hmm. perhaps with that piece, um, you know, of it, how we can build on this to then if we later want to do a digital version. Mm -hmm. um, I think providing a translation is something I hadn't really thought about mm -hmm. until you mentioned the, yeah. the bilingual medallion component. Um, but that that could be really valuable if we're able to do that. Um, so, yeah, I think sort of what I'm looking for before I just kind of jump into, like, how would I do this? <laughs> um, it's just a little bit more from other folks of if there's anything, it, it, as we think about what we want this to look like, that needs to be considered or, or built into yeah. the process. I mean, I think starting from the most basic requirement, I guess, parameter, the sort of starting point of what the driver was for this is that we don't have the original mm -hmm. document. <laughs> yeah. It's a scan of a scan of a scan of some right. really bad pictures from the yeah. 80s, right? So some of those photos are in the museum's uh, archive. Some of them are better than others. Um, it certainly would I mean, could be nice to have some newer pictures of some of the homes. Um, but, yeah. Something that I thought could be really cool would be if we're able to find historic photos of some of these and to include like a today photo. And if there is a historic, especially some of these that have changed in use, you know, there are some that used to be a different kind of building and are now a residential structure. That it would be really cool to be able to provide that contrast, whether that's something that we put in the book or something that we think about saving for an online resource. Mm -hmm. um, I think those could be some really, that seems like a really easy modernization step. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of, uh, I do think that in terms of the text, um, there are some places where maybe we want to think about writing a glossary of architectural terms. <laughs> um, it is very much copy pasted. I think some of the snippets out of basically the um, this the NPS submission for the yeah, district. It's probably the bedroom thing too. Yeah, yeah. I yeah very yeah. much focus on. <laughs> totally. I think that, and then I think there is sort of that decision point of what, how much do we want to preserve the privacy of the current occupants of the homes when we talk about, you know, descriptions of the interior features mm -hmm. um and whether we want to try to reach out to those folks and ask them okay. what their thought is with the understanding of this document could last 20 years and it might be a completely different person mm -hmm. but a completely different standard of how comfortable they are yeah i'm I was about to say, I feel like you should take it to where you are comfortable okay. taking it in some ways. Like, I mean, I think um, 
a couple things that came to mind is one, do we want to reach out to people and see if they're comfortable being on the tour? We're talking about the walking tour guides and how we would approach updating them at this point. Okay. I kind of feel like it's something we want people's approval on. If we're gonna, if I was a landowner, I would want to know that my house was listed yeah. <laughs> on the walking tour. And most people will probably be excited about it, but if there are some that are not, I would respect that. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was definitely one situation where you know we were standing like on the sidewalk right next to someone's house, staring at their house, and they certainly saw us. And I, I assume that happens to them every yeah. once in a while. They probably know why, yeah. but it, it did feel kind of odd. Right. <laughs> um, and I think having that conversation could really make that less weird for them. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a really good way for us to be able to engage some of the Washburn residents. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Where's my phone? It's um, okay. But it's um, we've been wanting to be more engaged and have more connections with Washburn residents in general. So this could be a way to start to reach out. And if there's folks who are really excited about it, and then their next step could be getting the medallions in, and then that is a marker that's in the Washburn district that increases excitement about it and awareness. Um, there's other questions of like we talked about virtual option which maybe is like the second step mm -hmm. of getting it updated it's like or, or it, the tenth step yeah, yeah. <laughs> right yeah. so first step i think is like let's reconfirm that folks that are listed in there are okay still being in there and then i guess second step would be is there anybody that's missing and maybe that's where we ask the museum um I don't know if some folks want to get together and do a little research on like what the primary contributing resources are in the district and what other ones. Yeah, just reviewing even the the original kind of survey or listing or whatever and reading through and yeah, if there's any that are really fascinating, like they could be added. And um, I do know that because I've done a lot of hunting in the museum archives. Or pictures of homes in the Washburn district used in the Atlas book, there are not very many. Okay. We have very, very few old pictures of like Washburn houses mm -hmm. that you can specifically identify. There's like a few. Mm -hmm. um, so the hospital, yes. Well, actually, we have one. We have one mm -hmm. kind of, it's the same one, I think, that in the book, actually. Um, well, no, it's older. It's an older picture. But I think that's not going to be like a deep resource for us in terms Got of it. updating. Okay. <laughs> that's helpful to know. Um, and then I think the other, the last question I said I had in terms of the process on this, um, I was thinking about how we could break this up for us as a committee to have a conversation about it. Um, and I was wondering how we would feel about me bringing maybe one to three every meeting for us to just sort of sit down and talk about, you know, should this stay in? What do we think about the current text? Um, you know, is there anything that we want to change? Um, I'd be happy to do sort of the background research for each of those and maybe take a stab at rewriting the text if it seems appropriate. Um, but I think that might help us to break it up to make this conversation something where we're not just staring at 20 houses in a row, just kind of going, okay, yes or no. Or maybe even, yes, going through the book and reaching out to those owners, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think one thing that might make sense for us to do um, around that, if we do want to um, initiate those conversations, would be maybe we should start by sending a letter, and I would be happy to also follow up by stopping by. Um, I don't know if that's something that we want to do, but it's something that I would be comfortable doing if that's an approach we want to take. Yeah, that letter probably would have to come from the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we could draft a letter that basically says, You've been in the historic walking room. If you didn't know, and then we're updating the guide, and uh, we want confirmation. Um, and then if we don't hear back from them by a certain date, we can follow up maybe with the house visit. Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't want to make anyone uncomfortable, but I do think there's a point at which we want to reach them and say, hi, we've been sending people to your house this whole time and mm -hmm. <laughs> we want your feedback. <laughs> yeah, and perhaps we could send out that letter first before just showing up at people's houses, you know. Awesome. Yeah. This is really good timing because I think if some progress is made in the next, like, four to six months and we're writing a grant again mm -hmm. for um so we can have an idea of funding opportunities related to it and where funds might be needed. So yeah, that would be great. Cool.
Um, so as next steps, I'm going to work on getting, I'm just going to start with the first three in the Washburn district. Um, and I will bring something to us um, next month on that. And then I will um, work on a first draft of a letter to folks. And then um, I don't know that we need to bring that back to the committee, but I, the, the, I don't know who I would talk to about getting that signed off on by the city. Yeah. Um, Laurel and Spiro. Okay. Does our like social social media okay. and anytime we have news, we want to do stories on projects and stuff, we run these through her. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it could probably go to you too. Right? Yeah, yeah. It could okay. come to me and then I'll route yeah. it around. Oh, perfect. Thank you. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, we also have both of them digital now. Um, mm -hmm. I think you put it on the website. Yeah. So if when when we're reviewing it, if folks are joining virtually, we could share. Um, let's work up here. Down here. Oh, that's the downtown one. So, yeah. right. Is everything okay? Don't have one there. We're just looking for the walking guide. Like just the downtown. Um, there, we there, do there. have both of them. I just. Um, but um, so the walking Washburn one, I think, is the one that we had scanned recently because we didn't have the original. So um, it's not great quality, but neither was that one. So <laughs> it might have gone on our website, is what I'm wondering. I can't remember if we put it on Springfield Oregon Speaks or because we had them both on our website and I think we wanted to update. Yeah. Anyways, we can find it. But um, I think it is on our website because I've downloaded it from there multiple times. Yeah. yeah. I always have to, I can never find it this way that you're finding it. Mm -hmm. I have to just Google historic. Yeah, I think I just Googled it and it's popped up. So I don't know how <laughs> where it really lives. I'm sorry, I might have missed this, but do we know how they came up with the, <laughs> the first, the initial list of? Okay. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about, yeah, right before you came in, we were talking about that none of us know how these got on there. <laughs> yeah, we also don't know when it was created. So if it was like probably a direct result of the, the listing of the district. Yeah. Yeah. Has the walking tour just always been the same? Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. That's 1980 something. No area code on that phone number. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> 753. Yeah, that's just our, our general line. That number hasn't changed either. <laughs> <laughs> Get a historic phone Another number. piece of history. <laughs> yeah, this in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that could definitely be some updating. Can you go crazy and use color? <laughs> uh, we might want to talk about printing costs. Yeah, we're going to do that. For the um, digital version. But yeah, that's, that's true. We could yeah. you know, easily put at least the thing online. These are all pretty modern pictures. Yeah. So I like your idea of having an historic image if and when we can. We have one in Mount Joy and we have one at the hospital. The um Shippo probably has pictures from when it was all listed at least. That's what these are. Yeah, I think oh, these are, really? Yeah. 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 So some of these you can tell that the trees, at least one of them, the trees are probably about that tall in the photo and are now okay. Yeah. Gigantic. So I, I yeah. would assume if this is if all of these are the same age that yeah it was taken in the eighties. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Any suggestions? Anyone would like to help me? Uh, <laughs> I was about to suggest I could copy edit for you. That would be great. Yeah, totally. I'm glad to be helpful however you however you like. That's a good project. Mm -hmm. Um and then I guess my last question on that would be 
I am okay to email the two of you about this outside of public meetings. Is that correct? Or do we have a quorum problem if I do that? We can't have more than three. Okay. Well, and you just can't make decisions, right? Is that true? Could you like discuss it or share content, but not make any like actual decisions or? So if you're, so technically that would be like a subcommittee, right? So they would have, well, with subcommittees, you have to post a meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Please show up. I'm just kidding. So yeah, it's, a, it's. Yeah. We would have to post it. Yeah. Uh, like we were doing for the awards, uh, every awards meeting we put together, we have to post it and give notice and all mm -hmm. that. Um, which, I mean, we can certainly do. For this. It's not that, I mean, it sounds terrible, but it, like if you just picked a standing bi-weekly meeting time and then you can just cancel it if you're not okay. doing it or something and then it's there. It's <coughs> um, And then you record it and you don't have to take notes or anything. Mm -hmm. So... That takes care of it. And then, because it's the accessibility thing, right. too, is like the online yeah. platform. Yeah. 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 I guess um, in terms of staff time, is that. You don't have to be at the, the uh, subcommittee meetings, I thought. No, I don't think so. Um, okay. Especially if. I mean, the, the only reason I was doing it before, too, was being the author of the meetings themselves to get them to run. Mm -hmm. So if that's established outside of me, then, yeah, I wouldn't be involved. It just gets recorded and sent to me. And, okay. Yeah. But okay. the link has to be made. Yeah. Public. So if you made a link and made somebody else the owner or the administrator? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, I guess... Sure there's ways to, to transfer <laughs> yeah. ownership there. Yeah. I will connect with you then yeah. offline to make sure we have this and it's all above board. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. That's exciting. Um, next on the agenda is the educational opportunities. So just to recap from the Dr. Lewis presentation, for those of you that were there, it blew my mind. There was standing room only. It was extremely successful. Um, and awesome. yeah, so mm -hmm. thanks. I mean, Charlotte did a, a whole bunch of promotion for it. Just a tiny bit. <laughs> I did a whole bunch of promotion for the it. And I think it seemed to work pretty well. Yeah. Um, it was one of those things like I've promoted a lot of different things in the last few years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, this time when I sent it to one person, I would almost immediately get a response to me like, I just sent it to 500 other people. <laughs> I'm so excited yeah. about this. So so that it just went really fast. And um, I think it just is indicative of people wanting more stuff like this. Mm -hmm. There has been very little. So many times I've been asked by people like where the resources for Kalapuya history or where important sites are, any of that kind of stuff. Like, we just don't have the documentation for it. So um, I think that's a, his, his research is a starting point for all that for our region, which is really exciting. Um, as a follow-up, um, he talked a little bit at that meeting about the work he did at the Whitaker neighborhood in Eugene. And he sent me an email um, afterwards saying he would be willing to do something similar for us for Springfield. And it might actually be easier for him because he was talking about how, I think for the Whitaker, they wanted to know like within that neighborhood, what was significant, if there's any significant sites and based on, you know, like records and history and location-based, like that specificity is really hard to get at in that small scale, but Springfield's slightly larger and it might actually be easier to create something for a bigger region like Springfield. So um, I asked him roughly how much he thought that would cost and he said, well, park for now would be, he would say about $5,000. So I said, I would bring that to the commission and let you guys know I won't be with the commission when it happens or when you write your next grant, but keep that in mind. And I, whoever next chair is, I can share his contact information and keep you guys in the loop for doing something like that. Um, the, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about just in my role outside of this is the Glenwood redevelopment happening and being proposed down there. Um, and there isn't, there's been some historic research done with that, but not an extremely deep dive. And that could be an opportunity where if there was, you know, something like the Calpia history documented um, in relation to certain projects, even like thinking about 
the riverfronts and the value of the riverfronts, knowing that area is going to totally change. How can we incorporate our knowledge and awareness into how that area redevelops? I don't know. I think it could be really valuable and help shape how some of that redevelopment happens. So just putting that out there for future consideration, because that's going to be a huge transformation in the next five to 10 years. And I think the Historic Commission wants to be, uh, should be, in my opinion, <laughs> should be very aware of what's happening there. Um, there's a couple buildings that they're talking about potentially preserving and trying to repurpose or maintain. Uh, but there's other things that are gonna disappear. And so it's like just being aware of what's happening, what's important to preserve, what to advocate for, do we even know, do we need to do more research um, or what can we do to support that so it happens in a good way and we don't lose things potentially that could be preserved. Um, so those kind of two different things, but it could be related. Um, but yeah, the I think the, um, the lecture was extremely successful. The location seemed like it worked awesome mm -hmm. for what a great turnout we had. So it would be a really easy thing to replicate in the future if there was another one. Yeah, it'd be nice to, I mean, have at least once a year, have yeah. Stuart Commission bring in a lecture like that. Like, that seems great. And yeah, if we can blossom it from there, great. But even if we just did one. Yeah. And if I remember right, it started as a conversation about training for the commission, and then we opened it up to the public. Mm -hmm. So to have such a huge response mm -hmm. in that change um, is really is really incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I had one conversation with somebody afterwards who was really enthusiastic, and they were like, "There are larger venues in Eugene next year. Do it in Eugene." Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> A little bit sassy and yeah. saying the city of Eugene wants to sponsor something in Eugene, that would be great. Yeah. As long as the city of Springfield is sponsoring yeah. it, we do it here. Yeah. Um, but I also noticed that a lot of people, as they were coming in the door, they were immediately reaching for a wallet, assuming that we were fundraising, or certainly that uh, snacks or things on the um, library table would be for sale. And it was kind of fun to watch people go, it's free. <laughs> what do you mean it's free? Yeah. And I didn't, I, I didn't pay for a ticket and, you know, kind of nervous. And it felt really good to be like, we just are excited that you're here. Like all our whole message is welcome. Come on in, make yourself at home. It's really, really cool. That's great. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'll second that. And I would say, you know, if we wanted to fundraise in the future, having an optional bowl there, um, I don't think it's necessary, but if, for whatever reason, if we wanted to, I think it could be a good opportunity. I mean, it could fund um, our awards program or something else potentially. I don't know if it could be offered to the speaker as well to say, like, mm -hmm. is there a particular project or organization that is featured in the presentation that we should fundraise for? I don't mm -hmm. know if there's any rules about that. I was actually going to, similar to that, I was wondering if we are thinking about doing this year late and we are thinking about picking you know, a historical topic every year that we want to sponsor a lecture on, um, if that is able to tie into something we are working on and perhaps tie into an opportunity for people to contribute to that project that we're working on, mm -hmm. um, I think that could be a really great way for folks to feel like they're involved in our work and part of making something happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know of what the I feel like we looked into this a little bit about getting sponsorships and donations from people, mm -hmm. but yeah, that would be the last little thing to look into to see what legal things are around collecting <laughs> money or how it can be used. Yeah. 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 At least this isn't here tonight. Um, yeah, some emails and see what we dug up before too. I just don't even remember. Yeah, um, things that worked really well and I feel like helped make it a huge success. Um, the Wildish Theater was super cheap, so I think it cost us 200, oh, I think it was $85 an hour with a three hour limit. Um, nice. And so that is so three cheap. Hour that, three hour minimum, yeah. sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, for all those staff that were there, he was helping like put up snacks one of the guys was running our snack table <laughs> i was not expecting that the mic the lighting you know even they were going to run the powerpoint for us at some point i mean they if i, I think we got the partner rate or whatever because we're from city of springfield so the venue was super cheap um getting the museum and the library to partner with us 
um, they were really happy to do it. So they have a really broad and excited um, following already um, for these types of programs. And so that was nice. Um, and then they also funded all the snacks. Do you get reimbursed for that? Yeah. I completely forgot about that. I completely forgot. <laughs> it ended up being not very much money. <clears throat> tried to spend the whole budget and I think I only spent 50 bucks on all of that really I think so I'll, I'll I should still have the receipt but if uh go get me I hope that doesn't mess up our budget because that's not no it's, it's totally outside of our budget because it's just okay. the museum reimbursing you or the sorry the library reimbursing you really okay yeah, right. grant couldn't be used for spend. yeah oh, right. so that's why they <laughs> pitched in okay I will look for that receipt thank you I yeah, you totally didn't have to pay for it. Otherwise, okay. it was sponsored by Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, on the snack part, and then uh, there's one other thing. Oh, I don't know. It just tied in really nicely because the city, the library, is about to do a whole program on um, the illumination exhibit. It's going to be focused on uh, American Indian, Alaska Native um, folks in the community. So. That all just lined, it all just lined up. That's part of why they were so excited about it, um, I think, at the library. So I mean, that could be an interesting tie-in to consider for future years mm -hmm. is tying in to the Illuminations yeah. exhibit for that year. If we can um, make that. Right? Because mm -hmm. they've, you know, they've usually planned it pretty far in advance. They've even done lots of interviewing. Like, they knew months ago what the right. kind of focus was going to be for the year. So, um yeah. Kind of like a kickoff for them, like get mm -hmm. excitement right. around it, yeah. some education and bring people together. And then they also, I think, had a sign up and they said they didn't have anybody sign up, but they had a lot of people taking cards and saying they were going to look at it more. So um, there was one other thing I was going to mention here next year. I wonder if we should do like some brief notes about what it, what it took to put the event together just so that a year from now, when we're trying to remember, we can recap, recap and mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I was trying to spill it all out into this recording. So you can watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, shoot, there was one other thing I'm not thinking of. Um, oh yeah, the miss. So one thing I felt like I missed, was um, acknowledging the historic commission. I got yeah. there and I realized I was like, I don't have a sign or anything. And then in the intro and the welcome, um, I had typed, I really quickly put together some stuff for the city manager to read. But um, it was just like, we were all represented by the city. So she was just representing the city, but you really shouldn't be getting some acknowledgement since we funded so much <laughs> of it. And we're trying to draw some of you know, like, rebrand ourselves <laughs> um so it, yeah in the future we could probably we don't have a historic commission logo or anything not that we need that but you know i just had city of springfield on there for us and then the museum had their logo and the library had theirs we could do one based on that medallion <laughs> the historic commission right in there something <laughs> to think about i don't know anyone who designs anything <laughs> 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 yeah, I, it was kind of interesting that um, I actually only got to see from very, very start of it, but the social piece um, certainly talked to a lot of folks who were really excited about the event, but didn't necessarily, like they're kind of asking me, you know, oh, what brought you here? And I explained I'm on the Historic Commission, and they didn't necessarily yeah. realize it was a Historic Commission event. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is maybe an opportunity for us, yeah. to, whether that's a logo or something, um, just to let people know we exist and then get involved with us. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah definitely. It was a missed opportunity, I think. That I, in hindsight, it was like the whole point was to, like, we were going to train ourselves and we opened it up and ended up training, I think it was a 300 seat capacity. Um, 280. Then, 280. Yeah. So, yeah, we were able yeah, to, we were, no, it was just people we standing. standing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think, um, yeah, I think that we definitely accomplished the goal. And now maybe we can get some credit for it next year. <laughs> yeah, resounding success. Let's do it again. Yeah. So, all right. Um, other thing, any other educational opportunities or 
things on people's radars? Um, I am going to a conference uh, in mid-October. I'm going to go to the Association for Preservation Technology conference up in Seattle for a week. Um, so I'll try to look for things that might be relevant to what we do here and, and bring that back. Cool. Might include two full days about the preservation of uh, laminate wood products. Mm -hmm. So interesting. I'm excited for yeah. it. I don't know if it will apply at all to the commission. I mean, but... lambs. Yeah, absolutely. Plywoods of all kinds. Mm -hmm. all well, that. we do have, don't we have a, a factory, like a laminate factory mm -hmm. here in Springfield? Mm -hmm. Yeah, plywood and woods. Yeah. All of them. All the lamps. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they're gonna be expanding too. We just talked about that in the board development. Yeah. And, uh, it's the Rosebrook. Rosebrook, so. yeah, maybe. Yeah, and that's one of like the big parts of the lumber history, I think, of our region is like I don't know if it was unique that we had that compared to other communities or something, but mm. I don't know. Just good to have knowledge of mm -hmm. it might tell in our uh Timber. Yeah, that's Timber. where I think I read it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, all the old growth went somewhere, so you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I also completed a training on the preservation of historic bridges mm -hmm. in the last two weeks, mm -hmm. but none of this accounts towards our budget. So uh, again, anybody who hasn't gotten to spend training money should be, get ready to do that in the next go around. Yeah. yeah. Anything we're sharing on that? Bridges are really cool. <laughs> are cool. <laughs> Short summary. <laughs> um, we did talk quite a bit about when it's, uh, you know, the value of relocating historic bridges as a form of preservation and um, to mitigate the loss of bridges when they can't be retained in, in situ. So, you know, ODOT, but other agencies in the state have a couple of bridges that are just disassembled and sitting in um, like boneyards <laughs> waiting for somebody to adopt them for, you know, a dollar mm -hmm. and put them somewhere that could use a historic bridge. <laughs> um, and so I, it's a really, really cool thing. I would love to learn more about what it really is involved because the bridge itself may be free, mm -hmm. but yeah, assembling it, transporting it, building the, baller, the what are they called, the bulkheads mm -hmm. to support it. All of that is so much more complicated, but um, if ever the city is thinking about building a new head bridge, it would be so cool to snag a historic one instead. Yeah, we could definitely adopt Hayden Bridge too as another option. Speaking of bridges, yeah, happy I mean, to love that in this. there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it. I've I agree a, but b. I don't know if Hayden Bridge is of a design where you can easily. Um, swap trusses in and out and make it larger or longer or shorter and uh, some of the ones that are have been salvaged and are just sitting in a boneyard so many trusses that they can be they can be sort of oh, adjusted actually. to fit the, the oh, span of cool. the river and still be considered historic features um, and the fact that they've been relocated is not always a reason for them to be considered no longer historic because they were designed to be prefabbed and moved on rails and moved around mm -hmm. where they where they were needed well, Hayden Bridge was originally somewhere else, too. Yeah. Yeah, it was on the Transcontinental Railroad. So we could totally move it with like just a couple uh, <laughs> couple of meters down to the city line if we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> we could adopt half of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the very first yeah. two feet or whatever. Be really interesting to understand what the liability around that's the, the whole adoption of half the bridge would look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the deal breaker was, last time. The pain of liability and the fact that it crosses over the, the city. Yeah. Um, Mid river. Yeah. Uh, the Amazon the bike trail. Oh, has, sorry. Uh, the Amazon bike trail has a historic bridge on it. That it goes out of Eugene, I know. It's been moved about two times since it's, you know, where it's where it is now. It was two other places before that. So, hmm. yeah, I can't think of that either. I'll have to go on my friend. It's uh, just just after um, <sighs> can't think of the street that uh, goes. Uh, 
uh, anyway, it's past it's past where they put that overpass bridge over the um, um, 18th Avenue. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Somebody it's uh, um, Moreland Park, kind of on this side or the west. It crosses. Let's see. It's further. So uh, yeah, further uh, west. And uh, oh, geez, I, I had to. Uh, chambers, so it's just past Chambers. In fact, uh, so when the bike trail crosses the uh, crosses back, it's on the you know north side, the bike trail there, and then it crosses back. Uh, Isn't that intersection there? Where it crosses, they'll keep going, following the, the trail, the bike trail. I've stopped there a couple of times. I know. Uh, uh, it must be further, further west. Further. <laughs> I know it's there. I've been oh, there. Know. There it is. Richardson. Yeah. Richardson. That's, that's <laughs> it's been moved twice since it, uh, that is the third place. Uh, yeah. Instant tour. Yeah. Yeah. Can we go over it? Hello, <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Good point. Yeah. Then we do the historic tour, historic bridge bike route. I don't like all the historic bridges. I, it tells you where it was, <laughs> and I think this is the third place that it's uh, been reset up. I think it was a highway. I don't remember now. We need a bridge. They've talked about it. It's in the plan. It is. So there is a plan um, from Island Park over. Is in discussion. So it's been in the plans for a long time. I wonder if that Hayden Bridge isn't quite long enough, and or if we really need a huge camber there, probably, like because it's really high, like where the existing bridges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the elevations of. Both sides of the river. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit tricky. But I think the further west you go, the better it gets. Mm -hmm. So it'd be funny looking if it was Hayden Bridge, but it was speed. <laughs> <laughs> or they just do kind of the uh the all the situation. Yeah. 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 Build a ferry. <laughs> Replace the original one. All right, lots of good frames. <laughs> I'm going to move us along. So um, budget update, there's nothing to update there. We have closed our budget. Um, did we spend it on? We did. We did. We might have overspent. Oh, oh, really? Sorry. Yeah. It's going to come out of another stream. Of... There's another stream? No, it's just that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now we know. Borrowing money. <laughs> yeah. Borrowing money from the city. <laughs> no, yeah, we spent it all. So it's... Uh, all been reported on, and Curry is taking it from there. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I know that Jason was super happy <clears throat> with the ILS and the RLS reports that we got in. Um, cool. He reviewed those pretty thoroughly, so you can feel good about that. Um, block party debrief, we already talked about that, so I'm going to jump to next steps. Uh, future meeting time change. So um, there's a request to consider a different meeting time. Um, I don't know what you all think, but um, 4.30 may be challenging for folks who work in the five. <laughs> and I, um, there's probably more than one person in that boat. So I was curious. I don't know how to approach this. It's always hard to find mm -hmm. new meeting times. Um, we could put out <clears throat> a doodle or something and just see what people list as possibilities for themselves and then maybe report back next month and see kind of what our windows look like as a whole commission. The big uh, question mark in that is that we could have two new members joining um, in the co next coming month. So I don't know if it's worth pausing on that discussion for when will those new people be joining? Um, yeah, I would think maybe December at the earliest, but I I don't think council's even going to be doing anything 
during the winter anyway, so it could be January. Um, they extended the um, application period because they didn't receive any for the historic commission. And I think like one or two other DCCs, so we're not the only ones, but yeah, that, that was extended. So we might be looking at January as far as that goes. Um, so anything we iron out now or in the coming meeting, it might still be open for debate, depending on how those people, yeah. or what they're open for. Um, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to do a doodle now, or would you rather wait until the potentially new two new members we could end up with nobody new as well would be um i mean we could do it it'll just to get a sense of it i guess the challenge i see is that i think the posting probably for the positions that are open say that the meetings are this time so it could be that like very specifically somebody's mm -hmm. be that. did we add something that was like that it can change or be flexible based on people. I don't feel like you're talking about yeah, I don't remember. It's a long time ago. Well, and if that happened, maybe it just means we would end up moving the time back. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, we have October and November left based on what I'm seeing up ahead. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, two meetings left this year. Um, so, is there a time frame to move back into the Jesse Main room? or perhaps a more public conference room in the future? Yeah, hopefully in the near future. Um, I know that Jesse Main was out of commission. They were updating the computers in there, I believe, uh, while they were doing all of the council chamber uh, renovations. So I think when they're done with the chambers, which they've ambitiously said is gonna be October, uh, I don't think that's gonna be the case, but um, Hopefully before the end of the year, like Christina said, we have two more meetings left. So we'll see if when we get into a more public space by then, um, if not the start of the year, then. And I'm fairly certain we're bound by Tuesdays. I think it does say in the code for the historic commission that it's the fourth occurring Tuesday of every month. So, uh, I don't know if a different day would work better for people or if it's specifically the times that we're looking at, but um, I think the day is fairly rigid at this point. Okay. Yeah. They put the day in the code. Yeah, I don't remember that. Code or bylaws or? or muni code, something huh? somewhere. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that it's the fourth Tuesday of every month. Hmm. Okay. That might be to avoid conflict with other public meetings. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, uh, I was going to say, um, are we going to put out that poll sooner or later? Should we do a vote on it or something? Because okay. I'm all with, um, I'm all with the suggestion of doing it earlier. I've just accepted a position where I end at 5 p.m. And so having a meeting at 4.30 would be... Uh, challenging to say the least mm -hmm. while well, working a nine to five job um i, I guess... personally don't i don't uh, either if we want to move it an hour up uh, personally it work that's fine with me i mean if people are working till five and uh, you want to move it to 5 30 to seven or something uh, personally it wouldn't bother me I guess that would be one option instead of doing a full total is just doing a little vote to see if folks are open to a five and we could try our best to try to keep it a one hour meeting most of the time <laughs> to accommodate that a little bit more for folks but because you know I like the chit chat during the meeting with <laughs> other folks and I know Elise is really good at getting through <laughs> we could let Elise uh maybe be the facilitator <laughs> And then we can be done in an hour. Um, does that seem, uh, I don't know, can we vote on that? Does that work for people? Five to, it would be five to 6.30 um, with a strong attempt to try to be down by six. Why wouldn't 5.30 maybe work better just because a lot of people work till yeah. five? 
Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, I'm some not, people uh, might not be able to do that. It just depends. Um, maybe it'd be better if we did figured out what people's availability was. Okay, we can just. Yeah. Let's do a poll. I'll do a poll. We'll figure out. We'll either start at five, five thirty, or five fifteen in there. Mm -hmm. I'll <laughs> I'll put the winner team in there. Um, and then I'll allow people to make comments too on things that might make it work better for them in general. And Unless we want to do breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. best meetings are breakfast time. Yeah. <laughs> to a Rotary Club meeting at seven o'clock a few weeks ago. And everybody was smiling, but me. <laughs> um, early. All right, um, I'll get that out. So um, elections, so I am, I have two meetings left in theory. Um, so we're gonna have my position open. Um, Elise is vice chair currently um, and would need to go there. That position would also need to go up for re-election um, in January per our bylaws or how our code requirements. So um, I wanna put that out there. I was gonna propose that we do that, uh, have nominations happen between now and the next meeting time and we vote at our next meeting so that we have potentially one meeting um, between when I leave and the next person takes over. Um, that would be a little bit ahead of time of what our code requirements are. I don't know if there's an issue with that, but um, I think that would be helpful so that I can at least have a chance to hand off the binders and resources to whoever wants to take them. That sound good? All right. Um, so I was hoping Elise would be here to tell us how this is supposed to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see Elise in the uh, video queue. Oh, is Elise here? Elise Actually, it's not Elise, it's Shannon. <laughs> uh. Okay. <laughs> and I will apologize for my tardiness. I thought it was Thursday and not today. So I am just joining because I looked at the end of day emails and saw you. So. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. We'll jump to you in just a second. Thank you for jumping on. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. So are we wanting to accept nominations at this meeting and then vote at the next meeting? Is that what I'm hearing from you? I think um, that's what I was going to see if Elise knew the official process. In the past, at our meetings, we've just asked if anybody wanted to nominate themselves or somebody else. Um, and then I think we... Really, I think we could leave that open for the next month to see if anybody else wanted to nominate between that time and then we actually vote at the next meeting. Yeah, my understanding is we don't have any process, correct? Because we don't have bylaws. So unless there's something in our code. I think there is a commissioner, overall commissioner bylaw that was created somewhat recently, right? Like for... Let me look into that and get okay. an idea. <laughs> I mean, so I would be happy to make a, a, a motion to open nominations and to close them at 445 on the something of October. Can we say 430? Just 430 okay. on October. Can somebody tell me? Uh, 430. 24. 24. Okay, so yeah, I would I would be happy to make that motion. That sounds great. We want to just vote on our process and then start our process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second. Anybody want a second? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Okay, so our nominations are open. Um, if you would like to submit a nomination, you can submit it to Tom, um, and then we will talk more about it at the next meeting. Great. Um, the remaining things, um, I'll just hit on real quick, the visioning for the next work plan. Um, let's talk about that at the next meeting. I think it would be, I would like to um, pass on as part of my passing on um, 
I think last time we did a little brainstorm of what people like to are interested in for the next round. I have that remaining list of projects still. I'd like to hit those again and see if we want to add anything and then pass that off before I leave. So I was thinking we could do that next month. Um, and then the last thing was combining November, December meetings. We've always done that because we hit Thanksgiving and we hit Christmas. And so we meet either the last weekend in November, the first weekend of December is what we've done, I think, in the past. Um, is there anybody opposed to moving our meeting to the first week of December um, and just having one meeting instead of two? That would be, that would mean meeting December. That works great. Okay. Let me look at my calendar. I'm going to miss the other trip. Okay. You got y'all can check your calendars and let me know if you have any issues with that. But we'll assume for now that that's a go. And I want to hand it off to Shannon. Thank you, Shannon, for being here. Um, who, as I said, was going to give us some uh, just kind of a Shannon. I I let them know you were going to join and just let us know about the ILS and any, any <coughs> tidbits that you learned along the way, um, and maybe what goes into an ILS for folks who may not know kind of what it included um, from your end. Well, thank you. And again, I'm sorry that it's out of order on your agenda. Um, I just got my dates mixed up and um, that's just the way things are. Um, but I wanted to, so we're talking about the uh, Frederick Lutaner Gray House, which is over at the um, Thurston Hills Natural Area. Um, it's blue, painted white, great um, house, and um, there was an intensive level survey. So that's what an ILS is. Um, it is a document that goes to uh, the State Historic Preservation Office um, to kind of prepare or make a proposal for basically showing that the um, property or the resource that you are wanting to nominate to the National Register of Historic Places actually warrants that uh, designation. Um, and so uh, the uh, Willamette Lane um, hired me first to do a condition assessment preservation plan for the Gray House. Um, and then uh, the intensive level survey was added to it. I would love to provide you with a number of really pretty pictures, uh, historic pictures of the Gray House. Um, but they actually are, th that's part of the issue. There are, is not a lot of, of information um, visually speaking besides what is there of the gray house at this point in time. We do have a descendant um, of the gray family who does have some family memorabilia that um, Christina and I are still working towards uh, getting information from her for some historic photos. Hopefully, you know, there's always that traditional house um, picture with the family in front of it, um, or, you know, with the, with the, the house in the background. Um, we do not have that information at this point in time. But what we do have are uh, records that date back before, um, uh, before 1858 that are the Donation Land Claim Act um, documentation to a um, person by the name last name of Looney who actually established that property as uh, the Donation Land Claim um, for the Looney family. Um, his, the um, Mr. Looney, whose name I'm not remembering at this present point in time and his wife Olive lived there um, but then sold the property to another person for and some intervening years between 1858 and 1861. Um, in that time frame, Mr. Looney passed away, leaving Olive Looney and her four children. And that's when um, Frederick Lutaner Gray, who emigrated out um, in the mid 1850s from um, the East, Via, I think Pennsylvania via Illinois and then across the Great Plains to um, Oregon. Um, he purchased it from the intermediate intermediary person. The reason why he purchased it is not 100% known, but he did marry Olive and, um, and started caring for that family in 1861. 
And that is the date that we put on the original construction of the um, gray house at this point in time, because he did build um, a, a farmhouse, essentially. Um, it's a box constructed farmhouse, uh, meaning that the walls are, are um, comprised of vertical planks. Um, <coughs> some of the plank, those uh, planks have been filled in with additional pieces of material um, from uh, plaster to possibly even beaver board. And there's lots of layers of wallpaper on the insides and even some um, actually old Oregonian um, strips from the Oregonian that date to 18... I want to say 1890. So um, thank you for popping that in there. I can provide some pictures of what I looked at uh, with the house. Uh, I was doing that when it passed it over to me. But um, essentially to say we've done some historic research of the house. I've crawled underneath it a little bit and up in the attic of it. And what that has told me is the house is actually, we discovered it is two pieces that are, one was built in about 1861 in an addition between 1875 and 1880. And this actually fits within the period of significance that includes like the settlement era of the uh, Willamette Valley. And there is a multiple property document an MPD that actually uh, can collect all of these early um, properties um, under one umbrella and actually be nominated into the National Register of Historic Places. So this ILS documented uh, basically was able to kind of say, yes, this this building qualifies. And one of the ways it qualified um, has to do with the number of remaining um, early um, early buildings from this era. Um, there are only, well, in the documentation and on the National Register, whatever we want to say, there, there have been three surveyed in Springfield proper. Um, all the other two properties are either so severely altered that they are not recognizable as early um, settlement era structures. Um, this is the only one that maintains its original character defining features or some of its character defining features that qualify it for the National Register of Historic Places. So through this discovery, um, there are two campaigns of building. One was the 1861 farmhouse, which is on the east side um, uh, of the house The uh, to the west side, which is to the right of this uh, image right here. That actually is an addition from 1875, 1880. And the stylistic qualities of that, the building technology of that, date it to that time period, even though we don't have any building permits or building records or any physical um, photographic evidence at this point in time that that is the um, era. But the uh, Gray family continued to grow from the 1860s and through the 1870s. And at one point there were nine children um, living in this house or a family of essentially 11 people. So having that addition or that West Wing, as I have called it, uh, made a lot of sense just given the genealogy um, and the evolution of the family. Um, a couple other things that are pretty significant about this building, um, the Grays actually owned it and the family stayed within the family up until it was given um, to the Willamette Lane Parks and Recreation District. So that Gray family is actually pretty important in the development of agricultural history. Uh, this house was, and this property was part of the Century Farm Program before it became part of the Parks and Recreation District. Um, there also is potential in this property, behind this property. Um, and the, I, I don't know if this is Potato Hill to be exact, but there was some evidence that um, there is some um, native um, sort of usage of this site um, and it was called Potato Hill and some of the archeology. span So there's actually prehistoric significance um, of the site or potentially as well. Um, Anyway, the ILS um, was uh, accepted by the State Historic Preservation Office. This building does fall under um, the multiple property listing for early settlement um, era houses um, or buildings. There, at the time of the survey in, nine, or, excuse me, not 19, 
2015 when it was accepted by the State Historic Preservation Office, um, there were just about 200 resources left um, uh, from this era, which was 18, I want to say 1840 through about 1870. Um, that number from that time has continued to dwindle. The three properties that I, I mentioned in Springfield area were all listed as potentials. The other two properties have so many adverse effects, they are barely recognizable. One's part of a church up in North um, Springfield. Another one is actually located near Thurston um, High School off, I wanna say off of 52nd Street. Um, and that one has also been moved. It is a house and it is still extant, um, but it is uh, has been moved. And this is the one that remains on its original site um, within its original setting and is the best example in Springfield and actually probably, probably even um, Lane County. Uh, and so that's what the ILS was able to discover. Um, we are also able to get some digitized copies of evolution of the property from about the 1930s up through then, uh, well, about 2000, actually, uh, from the University of Oregon's aerial maps um, library. So there are some more resources coming in still to help with um, nominating and understanding more history about the structure, but um, that document has been submitted and um, has been accepted at that point in time, this point in time. So I can provide other um, images here in a second if we wanted to share screens to look at kind of a tour of, of the building and the inside, um, like a walkthrough um, or not. I just don't have any pretty photographs, like hist historic photographs to, to, to provide for you because we only had one um, photograph that came from a document from 2004 and we haven't actually been able to find the original of that photograph even to this point whether it was Springfield Historic Museum Lane County Historic Museum um, yeah so so there's an imagery there's kind of a dearth of information um, in terms of the historic imagery photographic wise but that's only one way to kind of work through it um, also climbing through the building looking at the way it was built, the technology that was used to build it, the styles that it was built or that it were there originally um, are other ways to make that designation. And that's what we used for this in particular. So um, what would you guys like here? Would you like to go through the photos? Some are kind of rowdy. Any questions, I guess, first of all? You mentioned prehistoric significance. Yes. Could you elaborate on that? Only a little bit um, in that um, there have been some um, documentation that came up when I was working at the Springfield, um, working with the Springfield uh, Stark Museum. I asked about what their understanding was of the area uh, before the Gray family was there. And um, it's not considered, so the state of Oregon kind of puts out a like a heat map so to speak, of areas of, of Oregon that were more active um, for uh, Native American activity um, and tribal activity. Um, and it wasn't considered part of that heat map, so to speak, but there was um, reference to a place called Potato Hill in which from all of the references and inferences, they were kind of talking about like the Thurston Hills right there being Potato Hill. And um, the um, tribes would come down um, and they would fish the salmon on the Mackenzie because it was right at the confluence, essentially, or loosely at the confluence of the um, Willamette and the Mackenzie rivers. And so there was tribal traffic through that area back and forth for fishing um, and you know seasonal fishing, those sorts of things or migratory purposes. Beyond that, it wasn't considered an area that had like a village or what we would consider like deep archeological remains in the soil. Um, and that's about all I can tell you at this point about that, because I'm not the archeologist. I just also kind of looked at, you know, what kind of influences might've been there before. Um, certainly a lot of that early settlement era housing happens in places that are 
it similarly had been or was seasonally um, used by the the tribal connections and the the sort of patterns of migration through the area. So you always kind of ask that question as part of that sort of setup. Um, but again, um, archaeologically speaking, it didn't rise to the um, significance that would, you know, we want to include the significance of that, but it didn't make it exclusive, um, you know, or, or you know, a, a, a more, um, a better interpretation of the site specifically. So, you know, I'm always encouraging everybody to, to continue to interpret and to, to talk about these stories of, you know, migratory patterns and how the land has been used. And obviously the land is <clears throat> used quite a bit um, for moving up and down the Mackenzie uh, River Valley for uh, fishing in particular, salmon runs. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's uh, a good question. Shannon, did yes. you talk to Maddie about, also, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, did you talk to Maddie of the museum uh, did she share that oral history from the grave? Yes. Yeah. I actually still have it right here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And it is a great read. It was transcribed. So it's a it's a um, oral history from Mr. Hubert Gray, um, and it was transcribed in 1980. So it comes from 1979, 1980, and there is some really interesting information in there about the family, um, and and this is where it kind of gets tricky because there's some information about what they recollect um, about the building in particular. There was also an oral history done with Elva Gray before she passed away in which they suggested that the addition to the house wasn't done until 1915 or later um, or before, you know, because they don't remember the addition going on, but they don't also remember a lot of other things. And so um, that kind of threw off that evolution because it, originally it was like, well, it was constructed somewhere around 1915. But the problem with that was that the technology, the way the building actually connected to the original building, um, the balloon framing that's in the addition, uh, the stylistic qualities of the addition, um, all linked back further to 1875, 1880. Um, it's not a separate structure that was dragged or moved into place. It actually, the foundations are continuous and the floor joists for that first floor of the addition actually are sistered into or are actually kind of notched into the original um, sill, the wood sill that's underneath the building. So that indicates that that building was kind of built into the existing one. Um, where the influences came from of the stylistic qualities of that building, there were pattern books out at that time showing that sort of, if we look at the West edition, can we, um, let's see if I can find a good picture here to um, kind of walk you through what I was looking at. That's all. While you're looking, one of the things that I was, I guess, teasing for, which I can't remember exactly where it is in those, is I thought there was something in a reference in one of those histories about like an anecdote about basically the, that they cited the house kind of up on a hill based on like having chatted with the, you know, the the tribe members that were in the area at the time and how they advised, you know, why would you put your house in the, where the water is going to be, put it uphill. And so that was like why it was cited up the hill and that they used to, um, the, even after uh, most of the, the tribes were relocated, they, the members of the Warm Springs um, reservation would come down seasonally to work in the hop yards and they'd camp out um, around here and I think maybe the Gray family hosted some of that encampment um, and there would be fishing, yes. The fishing, but, yes. Um, and not always in that document either, very politically correct, I would have to yeah. say. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not that, you know, that it's just, a, that's another one of those sorts of challenges. Um, and, um, you know, I'm trying to, could grab for you in this um, some pictures that I was looking at. This is kind of a closer one up of the house, um, looking at oh, those. Sort of... I, yeah, I think you have the wrong screen shared. Maybe. Bye. Or you <laughs> see backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. 
oh man how do i stop sharing stop sharing <laughs> oh man uh let's see if i can get i'm looking for another picture here um this is all i'll start you with this guy here um is that no no it's that i'm selecting the right one that's crazy okay new share uh Is that the picture of the house? Yep. Yeah, that one's working? Yeah. It says it is. All right. Um, that's you know a close up. And what we're looking at right there on that um is the um this would use a, a porch on the side that's been filled in, and then um the original house massing is kind of um to the almost to the end of the porch that faces north, that sort of modern porch that's put onto it um and that was the original house it was a story and a half and we call it a story and a half because unless you get two full story height underneath there um you've got one continuous first floor and then a second floor that has like a coved ceiling or you know is only partially so it's it's a story and a half on the east side here which is the left side of the image is an original um porch that has been filled in um there was some question in my mind if that was like the front porch at one point because um it faced the working um farmyard so that that entry off of the left side would have faced outward towards um the the, the barn and the garden and other sorts of areas um and i can't because i don't have any photographic evidence or anything other than hearsay and you know, even even in our oral interviews, it doesn't really talk much about entry exits and and how the building was oriented directly. Um, what we do know is that that dormer that is over that front porch, um, that was an addition that fits the same quality and detailing as the entire addition on the west side of the house. And so you're looking at kind of woodworking, um, wood technology skills that were used at the time, the type of materials, the profiles of windows and doors, those sorts of things that help date, the, you know, what which section of the house is which. Um, and then um, there, there are two structures that are off to the left-hand side. One is older, and then there's a garage that's probably dates to about the 1940s. Um, the pump house that is the older one, I didn't, we didn't spend a lot of time on that, but we did include it in the ILS because it's kind of part of the property proper. And I think it's part of the history that links to the Gray family in particular. So it's not something to kind of be excluded, more just like, okay, there's still a choice to include or exclude that part of the, that in a National Register nomination directly. Um, and I'm trying to get to the photo of that west side of the house, which is hard because it's kind of behind um, a wooden fence. If you are approaching it from, you know, the general um, location where most uh, most people see the house in particular. Um, and so um, let's see if I can stop sharing again for a second. New share. This would be the one right here. Um, and that's the west edition. This building, the geometry of it, the detailing of the corners and the the top of the the, the moldings at the top of the columns at these corner boards, um, all lead to a very specific design type between 1875. You see it in pattern books all the way up to about 1890. So we've I've kind of picked 1880 or the circa 1880 because I couldn't give you a definitive date of when this was constructed. Um, questions came up in the ILS about, um, there is a scar for a door down here underneath this. And of course we have this kind of shadow where a door might've been on that west elevation. There's no documentation anywhere that talks about this second floor door. Um, there's no documentation that talks about ever having an entry on the west side whatsoever. Um, it led me to wonder if they actually ordered a pattern book house and built it into their existing house. And this is what the sort of pattern was, um, but they changed the inside of it. 
um, this dormer or this sign of central gable here is actually false. You cannot access it from inside the house. Um, on the second floor, you don't even know that that dormer or that door opening would even exist. Um, if you go up in the attic and you look back that direction, you don't even see it because you actually have a gable roof that comes down underneath it. And so there is no way of accessing this little piece of the attic space, as far as I could tell in my sort of um, wanderings. Um, I was only I was only there, you know, for two days and a couple hours with an engineer and another um, historic preservation specialist. So, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time and I also didn't want to disturb the um, extensive um, insulation that's been put in the attic space to keep the current occupants, you know, warm. Once you start compressing that or dealing with it or spreading it around, it starts doing all sorts of funny things. Um, so there's no evidence that this was ever used as a room or a dormer or something like that. So, um, you know, that, that question came up um, a couple times, a couple different ways with the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, that we had to address in the ILS about um, modifications, changes, or um, you know other sorts of um, challenges with the property. Um, so, so my current recommendation is that this was there. That's from all the family history that I have, and until I, I I'm able to get or we're able to find historic photos that sh show this side of the house, we're kind of stuck with. No, there probably wasn't a porch over it. We don't see an entry over it. We actually have an original window underneath here with the original window profile, wood window still in place. Um, and um, that window could have come, you know, from a different place and they just kind of modified it for their family needs is kind of my, my first take on the configuration of this addition onto the original house. Um, I'm going to actually really quick pull up here, hopefully, another image that I found through the report. Um, yeah, real quick, sorry, I'm going to interrupt for a second because we're at six o'clock. So if folks do need to leave, you're welcome to leave. And then um, if folks are interested, we can hang out and look at a couple more pictures and answer a couple more questions if folks have. Yeah. I am interested, but I have a six. <laughs> yes. so. I understand. I'll, I'll leave this one. This is from Eagle Point, and that's kind of a similar house that I was. I was trying to find similarities. Um, oh, that's cool. And that one's, you know, I don't know if that has the dates uh, directly. Um, that was just kind of where we went with some of this stuff. Um, and then I'm looking for the only other picture that I have. Um. That is elusive to me. Um, supplied information. If I can, if I can open that up, and then I'll share this. I'm going to share a different one here. Um, it's, I'm sorry, it's a PDF at the moment, but this is a PDF of the great um, project, and that picture is the only picture that I have of the front of the house, um, actually any picture of the house. And this tree that's in the middle is that really, really large tree. It's documented to have been planted in 1871, um, I believe by Hubert's dad. Um, but my, my recollection today is a little fuzzy on that. Um, and then within this report, um, I, it was a great report done by some students and actually former colleagues of mine, um, no bias or anything in there. But um, the only other picture that we had that gave any sort of clues that the house, you know, maybe um, was from somewhere else is right here on this page. And I wonder if I can't zoom myself in here to help you out. But there is a picture of, a pixelated picture of the uh, west elevation of the house in, in 2004. Um, and then on the right is a picture of the Dunn House in Eugene City from an Andrew Walling publication. And what you can see in that, although it's just a sketch, is you see the central gable and um, then a porch across 
and then you know symmetrical windows down below and it has a very similar configuration to what we're looking at um at that west <laughs> elevation as well but i have no photographic evidence um nothing in the for oral interviews or interviews with any of the family corroborate that there was a porch on the west side that there was any entry on the west side of the building um so my my thought is that either there was a builder in town who was building houses the way that this was being built or that they had a kit house um and those were available the 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 train was running in eugene city um area by i think 70 1878 so this could have been shipped in or portions of it made locally because there were planing mills by this time as well. And they built it the way they needed it for their family. So um, that was one thing that came out of the ILS and just that modification or question about that west side of the building. Um, I'd love for there to be more information, uh, family or otherwise in a historical society, but uh, Lane County did get back to me finally because they did finally open back up again and said, no, we've got nothing, you know, outside of these very, you know, limited items. Um, I found it really interesting. They couldn't even find the um, the Lane County history article that you sent me, Christina. Yeah. Or the, they said they didn't even have that. And I was like, OK, well, that's strange. Um so there were things that are missing in the, in the actual like historical research, but based on actual investigative evidence in the building itself, it's not a building that was somewhere else that was dragged to that site in particular. It's something that was built into the existing and original structure and surrounded the actual original hearth and the fireplace that's in there. Um, and then that dormer on the north side is really similar to could have been the door that was from the kit for this um west elevation and they actually put it instead into the north elevation i don't know if that's a, that's a, again i'm going a little wild on the conjecture with that um but it it there are a lot of questions still um however it is the most significant and most relatable piece of history to the um uh, early settlement era um, that we have, I think, really in Lane County. Anyway. Yeah. And prior to you doing this work, it was questionable whether it was even eligible. So I think that's the big takeaway that I was hoping folks <laughs> to get from this is that <clears throat> our, this project in particular was able to help establish the significance and confirm it. So. Um, I'll just add that from Wale Malane's side of things. Part of it was the condition assessment because they are looking at doing some work and improvements. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, there's a stone uh, foundation right now and things like that that we need to look at for long time <laughs> um, preservation of the structure. Um, and so Shannon has some recommendations along those lines of what to do. Uh, we want to make sure we're preserving it in a way that can still allow it to be registered um, in the future. And so I think that would be the next step is trying to get it listed at some point and trying to get funds to help um, work on some of these projects. Um, so yeah, you do have a Diamonds in the Rough um, preservation grant program there yeah. that could apply to this building. Um, and I just put up on the window here, uh, just the national, there's a multiple property documentation form. This is actually, I think, what sealed the deal, um, that it is eligible for the National Register, uh, because this was uh, put together and accepted in 2015, and it provided a sort of umbrella to collect all of these um, settlement era dwellings, barns, outbuildings, et cetera, to which we were able to link this building to. Um, and that would provide, so national register eligibility or listing could provide the diamonds in the rough, um, uh, grant program in particular. There are other programs that I don't think match this one very well, but, um, I recently talked to somebody, there's a grant program for heritage preservation, that's like, I think it's the Murdoch Trust or something out of Vancouver, Washington. And they're doing a lot of local um, uh, heritage philanthropy at the mm -hmm. moment. So I'll get you the links to that one because that just came through from another 
project that I was aware of um, um, that they were working on for an actual turning a house into a an actual active museum, not a house museum, but a museum like with um, all sorts of environmentally sensitive items in it. So mm -hmm. there was money available for that kind of project within that heritage house or that nationally register that national nomination mm -hmm. uh, resource as well. Cool, that's great. Also, uh, CLG you, money sometimes can go to these things. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I don't know what your your goals are there. I'm encouraging lots of different organizations, you know, asking questions about what they apply for, or what they use CLG money for. So um, sometimes actual bricks and mortar preservation for something specific to your community works really well for that. Other times it, it, it may be, it might not be the right time for that. Uh, are, is the ILS something that you have or are able to share with us, like this report or whatever? Yeah, um, I know that the file that I got from you, Shannon, is very large. So <laughs> let me go and look and see. The report itself is probably, I don't know, I'll just take a look. And see. A Dropbox link or something. Yeah, like that. definitely. I think I may have gotten it down to... Uh, let's actually shoot. That one is still really large at, um, yeah, it is really big. Um, Vishnu, I had to request extra storage space on our server. So that I uh, don't and the that reason why it's so big, it's because of how the form from the State Historic Preservation Office accepts the images. Yeah. And so the images are actually quite large, but there is a Word document that we could PDF separately and then separate it from the photos. And that might be a good way to pass it around. If I know a couple tricks too, I might be able to just export it in a way that can compress it, yeah, compress it extremely. And then you might not get high quality stuff, but you get the gist of what's in there. So I can try that. Yeah, yeah. we could put it in a zip file. Yeah. Yeah, I just I, I couldn't zip it for Shippo. So um and they had a huge file that I could uh that allowed me to do it. So um yeah, yeah there's a ton of great info between all the research documentation and the photographs and um everything that you put together, Shannon is Awesome. So it, it's time. also possible, Christina, if you wanted to just send around that Dropbox link, I, I, mm -hmm. I it's all still up there. So if you just want to drop me to share it and then it can be shared out, um, that's fine too. I don't have a problem unless. Also, I'll send it out to the commission. Okay. Um, yeah. That way it's not on the public side of things. I don't know why I couldn't be, but you know, <laughs> just do that for now. Um, yeah. What are you asking? I was just curious if Will Ameline's likely to pursue listing. Um, I think there's interest. So the property is co-owned with the city of Springfield. Um, I think that would be the next step is like, we definitely need to talk to the city and see if they're interested um, in getting it listed. I think we've worked that way and we've worked towards that in the past. And we've got a letter of um, questionable significance, which discouraged us from doing it the last time this came up. Um, but with this study in hand, I think that it's definitely more probable. So we just need to revisit that now. It's been a totally different staff and different time when we did it last thing. So <laughs> it's been true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that conversation will come up eventually. Um, but and the other good thing is that even if work is done before then, um, we have a good recommendation and documentation on how to do that work in a good way, hopefully preserve the important parts of the building and um, yeah. So. The person who did the um, estimate um, for the foundation um, work, he did the Cresswell um, schoolhouse that's right across from the Cresswell bakery, uh, mm -hmm. Cal Lewis. Um, so when he came out, he goes, oh, another one of these. I know these old girls really well. Um, and so I, you know, um, I, 
I was shocked a little bit by his estimate um, in a way, just because everything's expensive. Um, and he's not usually very expensive, but when you have to include other subcontractors for lifting to and doing concrete work and that sort of stuff, um, I, I think his estimate is as honest as they get. Um, that might be some bias that I've, but it's really hard to find people who will actually do this kind of work. And um, I would love to see a stone foundation stay a stone foundation forever. Um, it's really neat. And so if there's ever a chance to have a tour out there to actually see the stone foundation and the hearth is still on its dry stack stone foundation as well underneath it. Um, if you can get away from all the scat that's underneath the building, <laughs> um, <Dead> animals. <laughs> taking a look though is really neat because the the sill logs that are down there visible in the crawl space all have the original um, uh, ads marks because there are hand hewn um, uh, pieces down there in the base or underneath in the crawl space. Um, all the notches were hand done and you can see how that work was done. Um, and then this, just the way the, the stone was stacked and it is local, it's not coming from somewhere else. It was coming from, and I don't know exactly where, but there is that quarry on the other side of um, the Thurston Hills area. Um, it could have been coming from somewhere as close as right there. Um, but it has been shaped and, and they did a, a decent job since it's still there, you know, all these years later. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna, we're 15 minutes over, but thank you, yep. Shannon, so much. That's my fault. I'm really sorry, but thank you so much <laughs> yeah. for your patience and grace. <laughs> yeah, this is fun stuff, so we appreciate it. I'll be in touch with you soon. Sounds good. Um, and we'll see y'all next month. Thank you all for your service on the commission. It's really thank important you. to have you all, so. Thanks, thanks for your help. Yeah, thanks for, for your help. Take care. Sure. Bye. Bye. Bye.